Heading into give or take 97, 98, all of a sudden you are bestowed upon the, the gimmick of Kane. So what was that conversation like? Who came up with the idea of Kane creatively? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly who it was because so much of everything that we do is a collaborative effort, right? Um, the story, as I understand it, is this. This is right after the Kuwait trip that Big Van Vader was arrested. You know, he was detained in Kuwait, and Undertaker needed an opponent. And you know, they're, they're panicking because who's who's Mark going to work with at the next pay per view or whatever it was? And uh, you know, so they come up with this idea of Kane, which was it wasn't even called Kane yet. It was called Inferno with the with the characters originally. Made. And, you know, but basically they were going to hot shot it and they were going to use me because they could put, you know, uh, I, physically I matched Mark size, uh, you know, put me under the hood. Uh, no one you know, thought about the, the other characters. But then Vince really liked the idea. The story's great, right? You have these two brothers that are almost mythical uh, creatures. The other one tries to kill him in the fire and, you know, all this backstory they had going into that, right? And uh, and then that's where they came up with the character Kane. I think, you know, Bruce Pritchard uh, always loved the name Kane. In fact, he has a son named Kane. But Bruce and I were talking, and, and I pitched that too. I was like, you know, Inferno sounds like a cartoon name. Yeah. You know, Kane. You know, Kane and Abel and all that stuff. And then when, when Taker was first debuted uh, in, in uh, at Survivor Series uh, in 91, I think, uh, he was Kane the Undertaker, and he was Kane the Undertaker for like two weeks, and then they dropped the Kane part to stay in the Undertaker. Right. But you know, then you have the backstory was 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 Taker's original name was that an homage to his brother and all this stuff, you know? Um, and of course, I'm 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 thrilled because I'm going to get to work with Undertaker. Oh yeah, man! You're 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 it, you're, you're, it, you're stepping it, in one it, of the best spots ever. And, and here's yeah. the thing: going back to what you're saying, did not get any better than that, right? I, mean, yeah. I consider the Undertaker to probably be, be the greatest character ever created in the history of the wrestling business. And, you know, I, I love Ric Flair, the, the Hulk Hogan's, the, the Macho Man's, you know, Stone Cold, or whatever, and, and Kane as well. But the Undertaker, one of the heaviest duty gimmicks of all time, and there's probably no one better than Mark to pull it off. How is he on signing off on this? And 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 it's and it's different for guys of your size, Mark's size, because hey man, on one hand it's great you're probably not going to take as many bumps as everybody else, but on the other hand, man, you've got to have a dancing partner that can match your physicality to to really draw money. And so yeah. I'm sure that yeah, for for the Undertaker, yeah, finally I get a chance to work with a guy my size, so we can have fifty fifty matches, and he doesn't have to sell up right all the time. And, and you know, he he'll sell for anybody, but you got to stay on top of Undertaker's ass. So anyway, yeah. tell me about the the working relationship, uh, because there's got to be a lot of trust in this for you to play his brother, and uh, the chemistry you guys had in the ring was tremendous. But how how did that relationship? I know he'd already taken you under his wing. But then all of a sudden, you guys have got to become pretty close because you're dancing together damn near every night of the uh, of the, of the yep. week and drawing big money. Yep. Well, again, you know, going back to what Dutch Mantel told me um, at the time, I was working. I was working for Lawler uh, in in USWA. Um, I was still on a contract with WWF, but you know they weren't they weren't doing anything with me, and uh, so that they farmed me out to. A, uh, to Lawler, um, and I'm talking with Dutch about it, and Dutch is like, well, you know, if it's going to be successful because Mark is going to make it successful, right? And that's exactly what happened. I mean, uh, he'd always been a huge advocate of mine. In fact, my first match with Undertaker was actually in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Um, he, he and Shawn Michaels came down and did a show, I think it was called Super Bowl, uh, with, for Cornette. Um, and as you say, you know, he saw a big guy that uh, you know, I think that he felt that he could draw money with. You know, the, the thing about being a big guy in our business is, again, yeah, you don't have to take as many bumps and all that, but anything that you do has to look extremely believable because everything is exaggerated when, when you're bigger. I mean, people just expect that, right? Um, so that's sort of the drawback of it. And yes, you have to know how uh, – you have to know how to, to be vulnerable. You have to know how to sell in the right way or to register in the right way and all those all those things. Um, but I was very fortunate because Mark was all about the whole thing, you know, um, and just tremendously helpful. Uh, 
You know, in fact, it's one of those things where as, as it got to rolling, you know, you'd have egos that play every once in a while, right? And someone would maybe not want to do something that they needed to do. And basically, I would tell them, look, you can either do this or we can talk to Taker about it. And inevitably, they did what they were, you know, they did what I was asking them to do. <laughs> it was also, you know, Mark understood too, uh, you know, that um, success in this business, it, it, when you're in the ring, it takes, it is like a dance. I mean, it takes two people, uh, you know, to succeed. And, uh, you know, he's, he was always all about it. And uh, as, as much as anything, the plate or the, the table was set for me, dude. You know, I'm going to go in there with The Undertaker. Uh, Paul Bear had been talking about Kane for months before Kane ever came out. Uh, you know, all this stuff that was just set up that, that uh, Kane was going to be successful. I mean, you know, and I was just fortunate enough to be, you know, the guy that, that was in that position. Uh, and then to go out there with, you know, Taker, um, first match in Hell in a Cell, Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels, which had never happened before. I'm involved with that. It, it was just one of those things that I couldn't have written. I couldn't have written a better story than that. I know you'd already been working on the submission stuff. You've been going over to Japan. So obviously, you know, you like, and like you were just saying, as far as selling, registering, there's different levels. But then all of a sudden, when you turn into Kane and you're working with The Undertaker, did he pull you aside? Because even though you were a big guy then, you weren't really a big guy with stroke. Now you're working with a made guy who is who's the Undertaker, and you know there's been probably no one that's been more professional or cool than that guy, and you know a respected guy in the locker room because of his cool and calmness and this and just the way he thinks about the business, his whole approach. Did he did he just say? Okay, dude, you've been you've been doing great, but now you're my brother. You're working with me. There, there's 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 that rub there, which you've got to you've got to hold up your end of that, or what you're going to be doing with Mark is not going to matter. Did he have that conversation to you, to you as as far as selling and how to conduct business with smaller guys? We already had that conversation about two years ago when okay. I was Isaac Jacob, you know, and uh, uh, that's a lot of the reason that when. Um, I got the, the fake diesel character. It was a lot more successful because I realized what I had to do. And it, it was, you know, because Mark, you know, Mark had already had a conversation. But yes, after, you know, the Kane deal, it wasn't like he, you know, ever sat down and said it. But, you know, I, I understood. And a lot of times, again, I, I messed something up and feel bad about it. The reason I felt bad about it is I thought I let him down, you know, and he had invested so much into the care. I mean, you know, my first night, I, I dropped him. I mean, I, I tuned to him, piled drive the Undertaker. And he, that never happens. That made me right off the bat, you know. And anything that I would do to mess that up hurt him because he had done that for me. But I would go to him every once in a while and say, hey, you know, so-and-so wants to do this. And it was just, con you know, counsel. He'd be like, well, you know, he'd, he'd tell me, like, do whatever you want to do. But I wouldn't do that if I was in your spot. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know that 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 was that was awesome for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then Sean, I remember you know um, it, right before we did the deal at uh, Royal Rumble, I guess '98. Uh, you know, Taker and Sean had a casket match, and we had actually teased the unification of Kane and the Undertaker right before that, leading into that casket match. As you had morphed into Kane and started doing business at a high level, how did your working relationship with Vince McMahon change? Because obviously, I always tell people this, and you know from your first meeting in there, you go in there, you meet the guy, you've heard all the stories, he's a third generation promoter, he's an evil genius, he can take someone with some problems, spin them around, and they think they've got all the problems solved, and they walk out and think, hey man, I didn't I didn't really get a chance to <laughs> settle what I wanted to settle. Uh, he's just a, a master of, of psychology. And so I learned from my ringmaster days to when I turned into Stone Cold, and then as I started getting high Hot. My relationship with the man became much closer, not only on a professional level, but a personal level. And I've always told people I've learned more from working for Vince McMahon than I did in five years of college. So how did your relationship grow with Vince? Because he can be a very intimidating figure. Well, I feel the same way that you, uh, you know, you just said. It's the same for me. You know, a lot of what I've done, even outside of WWE and outside of wrestling, 
you know, and some success that I've had in other areas is because things that I've learned from him just by, you know, watching how he does things and approaches business. The thing about Vince is you you really have to be at that level, okay? And you have to act like you were at that level with him, you know, and to get him, you know, I think he always values people's input, but you have to be confident, I guess. And like with with the Isaac Gagan character, I wasn't. You know, I was still... But I've learned with, with Vince, the more that I'm that I'm confident about what I'm talking about or the more that I want to feel strongly about something, the more he respects my opinion. Um, that's a good spot to be in. He does, he does listen to his talent. A lot of times, like you said, what happens is you walk in and, you know, you think you accomplished something, you walk out and you're like, well, I just came out and I'm doing the same thing I didn't want to do when I went in, <laughs> you know. Um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's, he's the master of doing that. But, you know, a lot of times I have been able to, you know, be like, hey, this is, you know, this is why this is not a good idea, or this is why this is a good idea. And he does end up listening to you, you know, because he trusts you, and especially the longer you've been there. He realizes, especially the guy like me, he realizes I'm not in there just, you know, just for me. I'm, I'm in there because I may have a different perspective than what he does, but it's still in the best interest of his company. You know, I'm not in there just trying to try to do something for myself. But it does change over time, you know, because you work with someone for long enough. You know, the other thing about Vince is, man, he's, you know, he's, he's super loyal. You know, if you're loyal to him, he's going to be loyal to you. He's a businessman like anybody. He wants everybody to get over. Yeah. But the, the more serious you take the business, the more you're, you're, you're putting into it, the, you know, the more that you can. And, and the higher up you are and, and the longer you're there, the, the more you can develop that relationship. But, but, but to, to, in my opinion, Vince does not like pushovers. He likes a challenge. Now, does he yes, want a he diva or does he want someone to, to buck the promotion every time? No, that's not what he wants. But he does something. He, he enjoys people to challenge him, and he enjoys challenging people because he always says, Steve, I give people here opportunities, and that's the, that's the truth. And so that being said, as many yes men as he's had uh, and surrounded him for a long time, he likes the guys who will say, well, hey, what about this? And the higher level yep. the business is, the more serious it is. And that's serious money. And, and that's just business. I want to take you to a time. Uh, this is just give or take some time. You were running real hot as Kane, and you still had that, that, that mystique. I don't think the mask could come off. Oh, well, before I get to this, let me ask you, what was it like coming from the other gimmicks, going into the Kane gimmick with the mask, and that red and black outfit was total intimidation? How did that change how you felt when you when you work the crowd or performed because man this was just it to me is on the same well let's go back to when Undertaker debuted at Survivor Series whatever year it was when it showed the crowd that that camera panned the crowd there were kids that were literally scared to death I think he dropped Snooker right on his head pile driving him it, it, it was a complete work he, Snooker was okay but that gimmick scared people and Taker pulled it off like a charm so all of a sudden you've had these other gimmicks now you have this power persona, this this burnt guy, Undertaker's brother. How did that make you feel? Did it change your energy when you went out there? I mean, absolutely. Because, you know, not only am I in a, in a great spot, like you said, I have this awesome gimmick now. And people bought into it. I mean, from the very beginning. And, you know, it wasn't one of those things where you have even this baby face or heel thing. It, it was just cool, right? And, uh, you know, it, it was awesome. And, it, yeah, it did change change my energy and it changed my outlook as a performer because you know you always have that that part of you that uh kind of has to buy into things to be able you know be able to, to pull it off right yeah yeah and and i was able to buy into this man 